So I just want to talk a little bit about how API meshes revolutionize e-commerce, because that's kind of the area that um, I was thinking about. Um, I'm I'm Jaden uh, from Take Shape. There's my my Twitter. I'm at Jaden Guitar Man, and then obviously the Take Shape Twitter. Uh, it's just following the both of us because post a lot of uh, cool content on the Take Shape .io uh, or on the Take Shape .io Twitter. Um, but I also just post a, a lot of uh, similar stuff on on mine as well. So that'll be fun. But I was gonna I was gonna start off this talk with something. Um, sort of jarring, like talking about how you're lazy or, or something like that and going into how the Jamstack kind of promotes that. But, you know, now that I think about it, um, what, you know, when we think about it, the Jamstack really is simplicity. That's its its core tenant. That's why we all love it, right? And it, it sort of makes sense, though, that we'd want every part of it to be simple because that's what Jamstack is to us. There's been a big argument over what the Jamstack is recently, but it, we can all agree it's meant to be simple. And JavaScript can be learned with a little bit of effort and Markdown's simple enough, but that A in the middle, the APIs like like Artem brought out earlier, that's, it's a little bit, eh. <laughs> it's, it's a little bit more difficult, a little bit more complex. Uh, when we think about the different standards out there for APIs like REST and whatnot, every API is going to hold a slightly different version of it. Um, think about your favorite APIs and then go and compare their docs and you'll find that they they all have their own slightly different take on what REST is supposed to be or God forbid SOAP. Um, a lot of these different APIs, is the inconsistencies, they get a little confusing. Um, so I wanted to show you a little bit about what TakeShape can do and, and specifically the concept of an API mesh to, to create a solution to this because the Jamstack industry has always been about simple solutions to complex problems. And this is the simple solution to the complex problem of API inconsistencies. Um, so the API mesh just kind of stitches together all these external APIs that we we really like to use, but we don't want to interact with all the time. Um, it just sort of stitches them together into one standard conforming GraphQL endpoint. So we don't have to worry about a little details of each specific API. We just pipe them all through an API mesh like take shape and they'll just come out on the other side as one nice neat little package that we don't have to uh, we don't have to worry about it's a lot easier to handle um, I'm proud to be representing take shape because the, the, they invented it years ago uh, so it's going to be the most mature of the API meshes but the concepts are they're going to transfer over if, if you're using something newer um, but I'm going to sort of demonstrate sort of what take shape does here so I just listed some of the APIs that I like to use all the time um, in my e-commerce projects specifically. Auth0 for authentication. I like to use Snipcart for uh, for product management and stuff like that. I like to use MailChimp for marketing emails and SendGrid for transactional emails and then Stripe for payments. So already I'm talking about quite a large project, right? Um, but this gets sort of unwieldy. Like just the other day I was writing an article and I was trying to figure out how to make a Lambda function to put on Netlify with a, uh, getting data from Stripe and getting data from MailChimp. And then the idea was to sort of combine them together and create a slash get user endpoint uh, for Netlify. So this way I could just ask Netlify or ask my, you know, my endpoint for all the data about a given user and it would just give me the data I wanted. This turned about out to be way harder than I thought it was. Um, it was complex, it was long. It was uh, very verbose. Um, it was actually a couple hundred lines trying to get through all of the data, validating input, validating output, making sure the output was being piped to the right place in, or making like making sure the right uh, output from Stripe was being piped to the right place in my uh, my output from the, the, the API endpoint that I'm, I'm creating. It was, it was just really difficult and confusing. Whereas if you use an API mesh, you're only making that one request. So it's very simple and it's quick to write. And there you don't need validation going in and out because an API mesh using the concept of shapes is actually going to validate it for you. It's going to make sure that you know exactly what format um, data is going in to the API mesh and coming out. Uh, likewise, Using APIs the old-fashioned way, it's kind of difficult to see what's going on at a glance. You can't just look at it and be like, oh, I know what that is. 
I had to litter my code with comments and a lot of um, explanatory notes just to explain to myself what I was doing. Um, <laughs> it would be it would be miserable if someone else were to take on the project because then they would have they would have no idea what was going on in that file. Uh, so this is especially important in production environments. But if you're using a process like like an API mesh, the code is very short. Like I said, it's just one request. Um, the data that you're getting that you're putting in is unobscured. You know exactly the format that it's supposed to be, and you know exactly the format of the data coming out. The process isn't hidden. It's easy to see. It like I said, it's just one API request, so you know what it's doing with just looking at it. You don't have to read through hundreds of lines, and then something like take shape is going to provide you a, a GUI just to visualize it if you want. Likewise, uh, using APIs the old fashioned way, the security is a big consideration. I'm not a cybersecurity expert. And I'll be really honest, I, do, <laughs> I don't like cybersecurity. <laughs> it's, it's tough, because there's a lot of best practices that I, I don't know about that change all the time because there are always new attack vectors opening up and to make make sure that I'm protecting my sites I have to go through a lot of security stuff um, to make sure that I'm not like passing data from the client to the the underlying APIs without any validation or anything whereas with take shape your only security is that you have to keep the API se API key secret so you just make that one request and your API key is, is on your server. Um, that's that's the only thing you have to do because TakeShape is going to handle all of that security stuff for you. So there's a lot of benefits here besides just the convenience of only pushing it through one API. There's security benefits. You're making sure that maintenance is easier going forward. And you're also making sure that all data is validated and is exactly what you expect. Um, like how REST APIs, you'll get different data depending on the depending on the API. But GraphQL is, is standardized. What you ask for is what you get, and that doesn't change from app to app. You learn GraphQL once, uh, which is why I think someone was talking earlier about how they were learning GraphQL. It was a little weird for me when I learned it, but once I got it, man, it was useful. <laughs> I, I had tried to use it everywhere then, and I love it because I don't have to learn it 37 times. Um, but I know you guys have heard a lot about this before, so I want to sort of demonstrate this a little bit. Um, there are three concepts that, oh, that's awesome, Anthony. Um, that'll be very helpful as well. I just wanted to demonstrate three concepts that TakeShape uses to keep track of data flowing around in your project. Uh, so the first thing is, um, the first thing to know is that TakeShape actually has everything in something called a schema JSON. I just wanna um, show my tab here. Do, 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 do. There's another tab going on. There we go. This is, this is Take shape. I'm in a project here. You can actually go to your schema page and click the export button up here. And it'll download you a little JSON file. And this JSON file is very helpful because it stores all of the, the data that is used to build your project. So all of the stuff that I'm scrolling through is all stored in the schema JSON. So if I'm, <laughs> I know I'm bouncing between screens here. If I try to share. Adam, hopefully you guys can see Adam there. This is uh, one of the JSON files that I, I, I downloaded just a little bit earlier. And you'll see actually a lot of the things that we were creating. Uh, we've got queries, shapes, and services. These are the big three. There are some others, but those are the big three concepts that we want to keep in mind. Uh, services, first of all, they're the the places you want to connect to. So these are like the APIs that we're trying to abstract away, right? So I, I had just connected Stripe in this one. But you see it's it's storing all of that data here. It looks a little obtuse right now. But the good thing is 
that the, the 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 ones that are a little more difficult to type in manually, you can actually just do through the uh, through the GUI. Here, I know I'm bouncing around between screens. Take shape gives you like a little connect service button here. And you can click whatever type of service it is, say it's a, a REST service like Stripe, and you literally just go through this, this form here. You give it your authentication credentials and everything. It'll manage hashing it and saving it securely and all. This is my Stripe, uh, creden uh, my Stripe service, for example. Give it a name, give it a slug, give it a namespace, all the fun stuff. Give an endpoint. I, ju I just told TakeShape everything that it needs to know to connect to Stripe. Go down, there's my authentication and everything. And so now, just with giving it that information, TakeShape automatically knows how to connect to Stripe. It, However, it doesn't know what data to give it or what shape that data should be in. So that's where shapes come in handy. Shapes, you can click Add Shape here. They're kind of like a, like TypeScript interfaces. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that. Uh, I'd ask for a show of hands. If this was a, a real, real life conference. Um, oh, awesome. Okay, so one hand up. Unfortunately, you don't like TypeScript interfaces. I love them. Huh. <laughs> well, I think these are these are actually a little bit of an upgrade. Maybe, maybe this will resolve your concerns, Anthony. <laughs> um, the idea with shapes, obviously they're very integral to take shape. It's in the name actually. Um, but the idea of a shape is just to make sure that what we're passing around is what we expect it to be, right? So I can, I can create a new shape here. I'm actually gonna go into edit another shape that I have this, uh, this one here, just to show you what it looks like filled in. So when I ask Take Shape for data about my homepage, uh, what is it? What is it going to return back? I, I don't know. You know, normally if I'd ask another CMS or another API what for something, it'll it'll return something vaguely to spec, but it'll be a, still a little bit of trial and error. However, with these shapes, I can define exactly what is going to be brought out or, or given to me when I ask for the information about the home page. So it's going to give me a title and that's going to be a single line. So that's a, a string with no new lines. I'd ask, it, it would give me a, a something called hero uh, with the key is hero. And then the value would be an object. And inside that object, there's an, an image. Um, there's a featured product. So it can like relate to a, another product, right? To tell us what is on the home page. And then going outside of the hero object, there's something called featured collections, which is another relationship is related to a, another collection. So basically I've defined here exactly what, what this uh, homepage shape looks like, what the object looks like when I ask take shape, hey, what information should be on my homepage? I know exactly what I'm gonna get out of it. And that's that's represented in the schema JSON. You could do that manually, or you could do it with this handy dandy form here. So those are the, the, the first two key parts is the services and the shapes. And those comprise a lot of the internal stuff. So like knowing how to get to Stripe, knowing what shape all of the objects should be in and everything. But the real action part, like you could think of this as uh, your services, your your destination, your shape is is the car driving you around. But the real action part, the the road almost, or or something like that in this illustration, is the queries. Kind of they they work kind of like functions. You want to ask, take shape for something, right? Um, it works kind of like this. I can I can create a. Let's see here, I can create a, a GraphQL query with this get product list query, right? And then I think Anthony's gonna go into a lot more detail about this, so uh, I'll refer you to him. But you can ask it for all these details, right, about our products. Click run query and boom, there is all of the products that I've got. This, this one's actually built right into Take Shape, Anthony. Um, 
we got a lot of uh, little features like that just to try and make this all a lot more fun to use. Yeah, I think it's awesome. It's very helpful. Um, I've, I've been using it a lot recently. But uh, I ask it for this data. I can ask it for whatever, like say, I don't care about the slug. Don't care about the sizes, product ID. Maybe I don't care about colors, company, or the, the ID. I, I run the description. Oops, I uh, got a typo there. I run the query, and it just gets everything that I asked it for. This is products in an e-commerce site, obviously. So if I want to know like the fall bomber jacket, how much it costs, there it is. And this is actually pulling that data in from Stripe. You would never know, but it's asking Stripe for a specific subscription and just pulling it in along here while while we're talking. I didn't even didn't even show you how that works, but it's just kind of like working in the background, which I, I think is really cool. Um, let me get out of this. By the way, if you guys have any questions, just feel free to put them in the chat or, or just speak up or something. Um, get back here to the schema. Okay, so going back to the schema here. Um, in queries up here, we have kind of what we were looking at, like get product list is this one. Um, get home page is one we were looking at. All it does is it just gets information from a source or from a service, I should say, and tells us what comes out of it. So it's just like a, a little function. Like in this one, um, I have a, a different schema JSON here. It's the one we were just looking at using, where you can use a like a, a get. This one is the get Stripe user query, for example. It knows the shape of the arguments that go into the query, it knows the shape of the arguments that come out of the query, and then it knows like from a certain place in, yeah, Tristan, uh, it can it can pull a lot of them in. That's actually what this does, um, or what a, a different version of it does. So like, for example, right here, Stripe has a real, really weird like nested structure to their responses. It's crazy. <laughs> I, I don't like it. But I don't have to deal with it ever because I can just take this path to the data I want and just give it a handy dandy name right there called Stripe customer. Right. And we can do that and then just set it up like uh, with MailChimp as well to answer your, your question, Tristan. Um, like you could have another query right here called get MailChimp member or something like that and have all of the data. See, this is a ridiculously long path to get to that little piece of data from MailChimp. But I can just rename it to a, a little thing here called birthday or whatever. And so then you just you can actually run two queries, but in the same endpoint request and get all that data together. Um, I don't, off the top of my head, I don't know how to uh, merge them it is, it is, you know what, I suppose it's possible. I'd have to think on that for a little bit. I think I've, I did it in another project, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a very versatile tool so much so that it almost takes you a minute to get your head around it. So if you have any questions, feel free to, to talk to me after. But um, the, the, I think the, the genius of this system is just that you don't have to, to deal with any of that nonsense from the API anymore. Yeah, yeah, just one, Anthony. Here, I'll, I'll show you. Uh, if I can pull that back up. Jaden, do you mind repeating the, the question um, for the audio? Oh, sorry. I thought the chat was on the video. Uh, it, it, Anthony, it might be. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anthony said, can you get a unified endpoint? Uh, yes. That's this down here. It's a, a little hidden. Um, that's this endpoint. It's take shape, and then you have like your, your project ID in there. And then you give it your API key in the header and your query right here. It's like if I wanted to run uh, get product list and then I wanted to run like another query subsequent to answer your your uh, awesome. So like you could you could put these together 
and create something cool like that, Tristan. So that that sort of answers what you were talking about. Um, but yeah, GraphQL is very very awesome for this type of thing. But with with the the little bit of work that I just did, um, and I was rambling all through it, so it's not like it was a really long process or anything. Um, the API mesh is is working. We're done. That that was it. It's it's a little bit of a, a mind shift to to get something working like this. Oh no problem. It's a little bit of a mind shift, but now we're never going to have to look at those services again. I'll never have to type in one of those long paths to get to a some some first name in Mailchimp that's really hidden. I'm. It's just called what I want it to be called, and it's put where I want it to be put, and I can get it all with my other data. Um, very simple to set up. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to go to takeshape.io. If you sign up for an account, you'll get a link to our Slack uh, in an email, and there's like a thousand people on there, uh, tons of help, all ready to answer questions. Uh, it's awesome. Um, or the at takeshape.io on Twitter. We've got a, a couple of people um, who can help out over there as well. Uh, me specifically, I'm Jaden. I'm at Jaden Guitarman on Twitter. If you have any questions, you feel free to contact me at Jaden at Baptista.dev or that's my website, jaden.baptista.dev. Uh, otherwise, look, like I said, let me know if you have any questions, but uh, I'm really excited to, to hear what uh, all your questions and then what Anthony has to say about GraphQL later. So thank you. Awesome, thanks so much, Jaden. Uh, that was a great presentation. Um, so I, I, it sounds like people were asking a lot of great questions throughout the presentation. Does anyone want to unmute themselves and ask any final questions here? I know I rambled a lot, so I might have gotten to them. <laughs> you, you were you were definitely cycling through a lot of the questions. That was awesome yeah. that you were able to present and and field the questions at the same time. Uh, I guess the quick question I had is: so it looked like in your demo you had your schema.json file pretty much set up, and then you exported something from the interface, and it looked like you copy and pasted that uh, into that. Do you typically is the schema.json something you would typically write manually, or is it something you'd export from the interface and in, and in, in using your project? So. Basically, you can do almost everything here in in the GUI. Almost everything. Uh, they're working on adding the last couple little features that you, you can't do here. But for the most part, um, you just do everything here in the GUI. Um, when you need to go add some of those those features, like I was talking about some more advanced stuff, like adding custom queries and whatnot, um, for that, you would export your JSON and then open it up in your file editor. So I opened it up in Atom and you get this. Uh, and then you can edit it, and you go into your terminal and just re-upload it. Uh, there's a, a manual for that in the in the TakeShape docs on our, our site. Um, I believe it would be TakeShape. You do TakeShape login and link. Yeah, there we go, that one. And that'll just. Uh, Give, give you the, the chance to log in and then link it to a project. Obviously, it's pretty self-explanatory. But then um, you can do take shape. Uh, what's it called? Import. There we go. Take shape, import. And then you just give it the schema JSON file, and it'll go right back up. It'll validate it for you, make sure nothing's amiss. And then your, your query should, well, take shape. That was a bad pun. I'm sorry. <laughs> awesome. Th thank you. Well, if anybody else has any other questions, feel free to reach out to me. I know that's terrible. I'm sorry. Feel free to reach out to me, but I, I appreciate uh, you guys listening and asking questions in the chat. <laughs> Great. Um, awesome.